Thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar, Using Volunteers to Maintain Trails and Parks. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 102nd webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. And this webinar is one part of a three-part installment held in partnership with the New York State Recreation and Park Society Conference and select sessions that were canceled due to COVID-19. And this particular webinar series is offered free to the trails community thanks to a generous sponsorship from New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, the Recreational Trails Program, and the Federal Highway Administration. And as you'll note on this slide, the webinar is being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in both English and Spanish. And a link will follow along in the chat box if you've not already seen that. And if you do need Spanish, um, you can send us a question or send us a message via the questions box. Otherwise, you will see um, the language where you can select English, um, English or Spanish. Uh, attendees will also receive a closed caption transcript in both languages and a variety of learning credits are available. Send us a message with any questions on any of those items. And we are saving time for attendee uh, questions at the end of the webinar, but we welcome you to send your questions at any time during today's presentation via the questions box. And this will be an interactive presentation and also includes handouts that you will see in your webinar control panel, but they are also included on the web page for this webinar um, as a resource and will be sent to you in my follow-up email I send. So now I will um, hand controls off to Jane Daniels. She is the Yorktown Trail Supervisor with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. So Jane, you can take it away. Okay. Thank you, Candace, and welcome everybody. Um, I still see we are getting more people coming on uh, to the uh, webinar. Um, I will start off by saying that um, I live in, whoops, New York. Um, we have ran, ran into some technical difficulties um, here. Okay, um, sorry about that. Uh, okay. Um, while we're waiting for people to come on, Candace is going to put up a poll as to what kind of park you manage. Um, I think that's a nice piece of information for people who are taking the webinar so that they know how many um, are like them in a, say, a municipality, et cetera. So we'll take a few minutes to do that as more people come on. Okay, Candace usually allows about 30 seconds to a minute on that. Okay. Okay, but just another few more seconds here, Jane. More people are, okay. the numbers keep going up, so. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like we have most of the people on this are county or municipal uh, managing things, and we do have some others. Um, and they have said that they would said what how they operate um, using the question box. So Candace is going to turn this back over to me since we finished the poll. Okay. So I live in the New York, uh, just north of New York City in the Hudson Valley. A little bit more about me. I started hiking as an adult. Um, I never, I spent time in the woods as a child, but I definitely really love hiking. And I began volunteering for trails in 1979 for the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. So you can see in the next bullet, the types of things that I have done as a volunteer for trails. So it's not just maintaining a trail. I've had a number of management positions as a volunteer. And I pictured my husband here with me because we work as a team. He moves rocks, hammers nails, and I get the people to do that. The New York, New Jersey Trail Conference is um, an organization that turns 100 on Monday. Um, they take care of a lot of trails, 2,000 miles of them in the metro New York area. 
And we are volunteer based. We've always been volunteer based, although we have staff to support us at this point as we the organization has gotten bigger. The trail conference is unique among uh, organizations that do, that do trail work in that we have three levels of volunteer trail management. We have maintainers. Uh, they go out, they clip, they keep the trails open, and they in turn, if there are problems that they can't handle or have been uh, haven't been trained to handle, they notify their trail supervisor. And that's the volunteer position that I hold. Uh, the volunteer positions um, uh, trail uh, supervisor is basically the care and feeding of maintainers. You want, you take care of them so they can take care of the trails. They in turn re report to a trails chair. The trails chair is the one who primarily operates uh, with the um, a park managers and park personnel. Um, some of them are just like you. Where I live in Westchester County, there's so many parks and trails that I, as a supervisor, end up interacting with the park personnel, which is something that I really like. If you want to find out about the more about the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, you can go to um, the, our website, which is nynjtc.org. All right, volunteers. They come from all socioeconomic levels and they cover a wide range of activities, ranging from someone who works um, at the local volunteer fire department, someone else might um, help um, with the ambulance corps, you have church groups, um, people who will uh, go and help at a hospital. Um, years ago, they were called candy stripers for uh, younger people. And it's looked upon as providing a valuable and viable uh, experience um, for both the organization and the person. You can see the statistics there that say how many people have volunteer, volunteered uh, through an organization in 2018. And that doesn't count on the people who might be just helping their neighbors. Volunteers were looked upon as part of a workforce that sort of thought that it was going to go away when women returned to work in the 70s. That has not been the case. Okay. In the early 90s and late 80s, uh, the uh, volunteer experience was not considered viable if you would apply for a job. I felt that when I returned to the workforce, um, none of my volunteer ex um, experience counted except in one instance where I landed the job because it did count. And that was because I was a Girl Scout leader trainer and it was in human resources and I was going to be doing training. <laughs> so using volunteers on trails. Here's a list of the advantages of them. Okay, they can supplement your workforce. And I don't think anybody around here right now uh, can say that they've got plenty of money to do what they want, okay? They often can do something that you can't do because they have a passion for say gardening and they take care of the gardens that are um, outside the park office um, and they maintain, can maintain trails. They also can have a project completed at low or no cost to you. The disadvantages of them include that they're not free. They require supervision, whether by a park, um, some park manager or another person that is uh, in the um, your employee, they can go rogue, disappear, or leave. I had a, a maintainer leave um, last March. He bought a new house and moved out of the area. And all of the um, problems with the pandemic, the last thing he was going to think of to notify me that he was no longer going to be able to maintain that trail. Um, I have an instance where I have I'm leaving a managerial position because um, I don't have the bandwidth uh, to continue, and by creating a void, someone who will be needed needs to step up. Um, a question that was raised about union issues: um, a lot depends upon the people involved. Um, in one park I was volunteering for, when I first started, the employees didn't really like the volunteers. Um, when there was a change of management, um, the person who was the assistant park manager came in and he had worked with me actually in another park. And 
um, embraced the idea of volunteers helping uh, very enthusiastically and was able to shift some of the anti-volunteer aspect away. So I'm going to talk about some types of volunteers, um, ones that might help you with trails in your park. They're individuals, they're groups that are established. Um, they're episodic ones where you come in, do a job and leave, and a special one under episodic is youth projects. I will go into all of those uh, three instances and uh, give you examples of how it works and some pluses and minuses of them. So individual maintainers, volunteer, um, a park manager would end up interacting with them or someone who was on their staff. These three organizations use individual maintainers. Uh, they have signed them a park to manage, um, which gives them a very big sense of ownership. And um, the park has a bit more control over that person. The disadvantage, of course, is that you have to supervise them. And of course, they can disappear or go rogue. I've listed some activities there um, that an individual might do. Um, someone had raised a question earlier um, uh, when they registered. Training people to remove invasives is very important, and I can go into that a little bit later. Let's look to organized groups. You can see the logos of the four organizations that I put there, and they're one of many that um, will use volunteers to uh, maintain their trails. When you work with an organized group, um, let's use as an example, PATC manages the Appalachian Trail, um, not only in Shenandoah National Park, but as it works its way to a Harpers Ferry. That organization also maintains trails in Shenandoah National Park. The park managers in those instances, they look to PATC, uh, which stands for the Potomac Appalachian Mountain Club, to recruit, train, and supervise. Okay. The volunteers will identify with PATC, and PATC has some control over what the uh, maintainers are doing. The disadvantage of, of having a group identify is it's not going to identify necessarily with your park. For PATC, those people generally will um, identify with the Appalachian Trail, not necessarily with uh, Shenandoah National Park. Again, that you could have um, a group disappear or go rogue. I know from my experience in being on the Appalachian Trail, uh, conferences, board of managers, as it was then known, um, there was a, a whole group that just simply disappeared and wasn't working at all. And it had to be, they had to figure out how to manage that. Um, because these groups control the volunteers, you don't have a say in who who is a volunteer, um, but that can work to your advantage because you're having, you've already delegated to those people to take uh, care of getting the volunteers. Like the other two, like the individual maintainers, you can have them maintain trails, but you, because you are using a group, you, they will often have a group that will go out and build trails for you and do um, other activities along that line. And these groups might assign an individual or they'll do episodic events. Now, episodic events mean you can get a job done um, with many hands. They're generally people with low skills, although if you're building trails um, or building a boardwalk, those will be slightly higher level skills. And you're tying into people's passions, particularly when you do run these, um, that's how you attract them. Um, again, the types of projects that you can use range from removing litter bases or graffiti, doing trail maintenance, but they can also do build a boardwalk or build a trail. The disadvantages are they have no commitment when the project ends and they require the staff to set up the time. 
So Westchester Parks Foundation uses um, episodic groups to take care of things and it found them very effective um, this summer and fall because they can bring groups, a group of 10 in um, because that's the recommended group size to do something. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Washington Trails uses both staff and volunteers to run their trail program, uh, whether it's uh, uh, trail maintenance or building uh, trails. So here's another poll for you. Um, what kind of volunteers have you used? We'll give you a few minutes. And Jane, to this. Yeah. yeah, while we're waiting for those, um, for the attendees to answer that poll. Um, in regards to your audio, it just seems like you might be moving away from the, the microphone at times and you get a little bit quieter, harder to understand. So just keep that in mind okay. as we move forward. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so it looks like most of the time people have worked on episodic projects, but it clearly that um, we have uh, quite a range and glad to see so many of you who are participating have used volunteers and the ones who've never used them. I'm hoping you think as a result of this workshop, you're going to, you're going to be able to use them. Okay. So we'll go to the next one. So if you're going to use volunteers, how can you create um, increase your chances of using volunteers successfully? I like to think if you start small with a highly visible project and at low cost, you're going to increase your chances tremendously. You also need to know what you want them to do. Is it going to be moving rocks? Is it going to be um, clipping uh, the trail? And um, no matter what, you need to establish guidelines and restrictions. Uh, you want them to know that safety first, that safety uh, talk first is always important with a, an episodic group, especially if you don't know the people. You want them to have a good time. It's clear from this picture, the two people in it are having a great time. They've obviously done something they like and you want to complete the job. Um, it's very difficult to, set, uh, when you have stated that well, we're going to build so many feet of boardwalk and you don't complete it, um, by not announcing that you're going to build this many today works. Um, you just let people know, hey, we did a lot today and thank them. Um, having supervisors who are knowledgeable or necessary, I like to joke since I can't, hammer nails very well i'll find you the people who can um, but i do find people who can and i often delegate to them to help others in that particular task so let's develop a game plan to set up a program so these are six steps that are um, necessary and you're probably wondering what this picture of a lot of vegetation is about. That's what, where the um, site where I was going to be building 500 feet of boardwalk and the people who came in to clear it were a very different group that actually built the boardwalk. So I had to assess my human resources and I was very clear on what needed to be done. Um, for this particular project, we already know we had funding as, as part of a grant. Um, I planned the recruiting and outreach that I needed. Um, and I went about hosting a project. It took us about six days to get all the way through this at, at three hours uh, work sessions each. And people had a good time doing it. And I was able to um, get the trail cleared enough so that we could build the boardwalk. So. Another thing on identifying your needs, what kind of trails do you have? Okay, how many miles, your user groups, and the tasks that need doing. 
Um, this photo shows two people who are working with their partner on the left. They're assessing what needs to be done um, on some trails at T-Town, which is a local nonprofit area near where I live. Um, what kind of conflicts can arise between user groups if you're going to be building these trails? Let's identify your human resources. We'll go back to who are your user groups? Who can you, and what hiking or biking organizations exist nearby? Um, in New York, in Westchester County, where I live, there is an organization called um, Volunteer New York. And they'll sign up volunteers and you can use them as a source if you wish. Uh, locally, I've uh, put, tied into Boy Scout troops um, for uh, projects and for conservation oriented projects that many of the boys need to re reach um, one of the levels in scouting. Do you celebrate Earth Day or National Trails Day? That's a great way of getting a project done because you're reaching a wider audience to help. And in some instances, if you have an outdoor recreation store that's either local or national, uh, you can tap into them. Uh, sometimes they will provide sponsorship. Part of, the, of your project is you have to identify material and equipment needs. A uh, bill of materials is needed if you're going to build any structure. Um, it also, you need to know and let people know what kind of equipment they need to bring or that you're going to apply, uh, supply. Uh, who's going to pay for what? Who brings what? And where can you store it? So the pictures here are from that 500 plus foot boardwalk I was talking about building. Um, we ended up having a job box um, that we left on site for our generator and some other tools. But you can see in the upper left hand corner the number of people who, the amount of equipment we needed um, to be able to work on any particular work day. And uh, my husband and I would bring that every day to the work site and the volunteers would help us car carry it in, which was fortunately right next to a road. So having your pro uh, first project as an episodic one, I really recommend it. It engages the community. This, our boardwalk that I was building, um, we'd had press information about it. We had people show up. Um, some maybe came once, others came many times. You, it allows you to assess the uh, potential for individual volunteers. The two young men that you see in the upper right hand corner um, were sophomores in high school when they appeared on this project. They're now seniors and they approached me for a civic internship to do a trail project. I assigned them to, be, to build a reroute. They're working on their own, okay? Uh, yes, I won't have them uh, when they head off to college, but they have had a good idea of how to work with a group, how to uh, manage a project, and uh, to feel really good that they had done something to help their community. Um, the other thing is that you can identify pe uh, potential leaders. Terry, who is the man in the lower left-hand corner, helped on a boardwalk um, in the state park that was nearby, and he also helped on building the boardwalk. His children are now in high school. The oldest one drives. He's ready to step up uh, to a leadership position, although he doesn't completely realize what I have in mind for him because I'm slowly training him in a number of ways. All right, so now it's time for a poll again. Which project are you gonna choose as your first one? Okay. Um, looks like a number of you want to uh, have trail maintainers. You're going to move, remove invasives, pick up litter, distribute wood chips. I'm curious as the ones who wanted to build a long boardwalk. Uh, that's expensive. I hope you have experienced people who are going to do that. 
And um, I wouldn't recommend it for a first project because of the expense and the amount of skill that is required for someone to manage it. Let's go on to the next slide. All right. So getting started. Okay. So this is sort of a checklist of, of thinking of what needs to be done. And since we're going to be clearing overgrown trails at Hillside Park, okay, um, I've identified some things that I would like to happen. Identifying a supervisor to move forward is going to be probably a couple projects out, but I put it there to say, you might be lucky to get someone that you realize that you'd like to have being um, a volunteer in a more managerial and uh, administrative position. Um, in this case, making it ongoing would be a good idea. And so the first time using park owned tools is a good idea. The New York, New Jersey Trail Conference tells their maintainers they have to supply their own tools. So they have clippers, loppers, um, they supply their own gloves because of the pandemic, they need to wear a mask. Um, they might have a small handsaw that they use. Um, uh, they may not use chainsaws. Um, the trail conference uh, has certified chainsawyers who have taken a class through the um, forest service and certifies them for three years to be able to remove trees. Um, if you're gonna have a group, uh, keep in mind the 10 at this point so that you have not only you, but maybe somebody else that is um, overseeing this particular project. Um, recruiting. Um, those three that I've listed are good, and I'll go into some more things about recruiting in a little bit. And having staff welcome volunteers, even if it's volunteers who are running it, is always a good idea. It doesn't, it shows that you're committed to um, thanking them for uh, what they are doing. Safety talks are always necessary. Um, you want to make sure people know to stay out of what we call the bloody zone, which is the distance a uh, tool is extended from your arm. Um, and uh, there also should be first aid kits that are along uh, with you. I always thank them at the end and say how much they've done. And I usually follow up in some instances, especially if you have their email and say, hey, thanks, here's a photo of what we've done. <laughs> So here's another way of setting up your project. And this is more detailed um, than the other one, which was just answering some questions about a specific one. Um, this points out, this list stuff, this is one of the um, handouts that you will get uh, later. Um, this one goes over the things for clearing trails at Hillside again. But I'd like to point out that the two um, bottom lines I have the same project, which is build 40 feet of boardwalk. And if you notice in the funding column uh, for having volunteers do it, you need either a grant or your budget of $600 to be able to build it. If you have an Eagle Scout build it, he has to fundraise for the, for the uh, money. He might not know how to build the boardwalk, but you would supply someone who would show them how to do it, what needs to be done. And in the end, it's going to cost you less money. Finding people. Um, asking what your first project requires. Were there people with low skills, um, with skills, or people who can supervise? So this particular project was building 107 feet of boardwalk in the state park. Um, we needed people with low skills because they needed to uh, move the lumber from where the park had brought it in to the site. Um, we also needed people who were able to hammer the uh, decking onto the um, boardwalk. But I needed people with skills like Bill here has. He clearly is using the level to make sure that the sleeper on the ground is level. Um, and I also had people who uh, could supervise the others. I could see um, that they could manage that, leaving me free to troubleshoot. Terry, who I talked about earlier, 
he was one of the people that I ended up using as a supervisor uh, for me on this project just to make sure things were working right. So where to look and how to recruit are very important. I'd also like to point out that Bill was really enthusiastic about this project. He knew of some upcoming ones and wanted to volunteer, but because he had other commitments, he wasn't able to follow through. Did I resent that he didn't show up for the other ones when he said he would? No, he was very helpful on this one. I was very glad to have him. And I understood that he had other commitments. I also know that when you're doing recruiting, if you don't know what you want them to do, you can't ask them to volunteer. Um, so here's some recruiting methods. You will get this chart and the next one as handouts after the program is finished. But I've decided to highlight just a few of them to um, elaborate. Email is very expensive easy to use it's you can send to groups okay but it doesn't reach anybody who doesn't have an email address or will not allow you to this day and age occasionally you run into someone like that i've had people say i want to help i don't give out my email or i don't have an email so you have to accept that um, that you will miss some people that way social media also helps because you'll be a wider group but only if they happen to have um, signed into, for instance, like on Facebook, they're friends with your uh, community. The ad in a newspaper gives you a, a newsletter, gives you a broader reach. Um, I've used that very successfully. Um, when I was working on the long, the 500 foot boardwalk, I had a newsletter I sent out um, the Monday before the Friday work trip um, that said what we was going to do when to come, what to bring, uh, pictures from the last um, work trip, and thank the people who had come that the previous work trip. It got me a lot of people, they might come for one or two times, some of them didn't like moving lumber, um, others didn't like hammering, and it was pretty muddy, and some people, the kids didn't mind that at all, I don't know how their mothers liked it. <laughs> So some other, those are all written. Um, contacting a group uh, means you're, they're gonna find volunteers. So you might contact um, a church group and say, we're doing some um, invasive removal in a park that's uh, across the street from your church. Would you be willing to give us a hand that day? Um, you can say, you can see someone in action, see what they're doing. Um, uh, it might be at another uh, event that you've attended, but you think, hey, um, my favorite story is that someone in the trail conference ended up getting a very valued volunteer because they, discussed, they were both working at the local food bank. And um, Carl was interested and he hiked. He was looking for something to do since he retired. And uh, he was nabbed and he had used to hold a volunteer position equivalent to mine over in New Jersey. Uh, a group needs a project and they contact you. That takes a little bit of finesse on your part to find something that, they, that they're capable of doing. And so my husband and I always have what we call a shovel ready project. So if someone contacts us, we can say, oh, we have this project, this project, or this project. Sometimes it's removing invasives, other times it's doing some simple trail work. So when you write an ad, Okay, you wanna get people's attention. The ad on the left isn't meant for you to read per se, but to see how wordy it is when you compare it for the same information that is conveyed in the one on the right. The one on the left I actually saw on a website. The one on the right is what I took that information and reconfigured it. And if you note at the bottom, I have sometimes volunteer opportunities lead to internships. That is a way of telling people we value you, okay, and your your into your efforts will benefit you also. So I'll give a few minutes if you want to read those. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. So this is recruiting. 
um, listen, don't talk. And you're always on the lookout to think of somebody who might be willing to help. Um, before you talk to them and make the pitch, you need to increase your chances of success knowing how to contact them. If you think that they might be interested and you ask that, you take their, using your cell phone, write down their email address and send them an email immediately saying, thanks for stopping and talking. Um, I'll, I'll reach out to you later when we happen to have something that you might be interested in. Um, that also brings into account where to post that information. Um, it might be a, your newsletter. It could be if the church has reached out to you and said they want a, a project, um, they're the ones that end up having to post it, but you give them the ad so that they can post it. We have what's called over the transom. That means somebody comes forward and says they want to volunteer and they have something specific in mind that really works well. It's tough when they say they want to volunteer and you have no idea of what they want to volunteer for. And so that's why recruiting is all about listening. So Westchester Parks Foundation does a lot of episodic events and they post this particular um, poster on their uh, Facebook page. And you can see they have an extensive list of uh, opportunities uh, for 10 people each time. They have two staff members that run this program because they're trying to establish the Green Squad, which ultimately would be in all of their parks to be able to do things like pick up litter, maintain the trail, remove graffiti, and uh, remove invasives. They also, until the pandemic st uh, struck in uh, last spring, they used corporate days of service to help for some of these uh, events. Uh, but that um, the corporations are not too thrilled on doing it. And so that's on hold until uh, some restrictions are listed. They also want to turn some of these into community based. So they have a group of people who show up regularly and will take care of um, a part particular projects in a particular park. So everybody likes to know about funding. Where do you get your money? Um, this webinar isn't about funding and fundraising. There are many, many opportunities, different places where you can learn about funding and funding is very particular to uh, a project. If you're interested in grants, there's a database available through public libraries at candid.org slash find us. It's find hyphen us. This um, is the Foundation Center Library where they've changed their name. And um, if you have a library card through your public library, you should be able to uh, access this. And each, each different areas have um, access to more information through Candid, through some of the larger libraries that are around. Unfortunately, because of COVID, the public libraries are closed, but you can still often get access online for things. Another part of where you fund things is that you make it part of your budget. Okay. Corporate days of service, you ask funding for materials, or in some instances, the New York New Jersey Trail Conference asks them to make a contribution. In Westchester, when um, we do uh, the different um, supervisors hold uh, corporate days of service, um, we are grandfathered in and the those corporations are not asked by the trail conference because we've already established um, a precedent on how we operate. Um, many parks have um, nonprofits associated with them. Um, they might be um, a foundation, an association, a conservancy. National parks in particular have this. They raise funds for um, projects and for extras for the park. Um, find out if there is a friends group uh, associated with your park and how you can tie into getting uh, some funding. Outdoor recreation stores often will sponsor or provide some um, funding. Um, look around in your uh, community to see if there is one. And of course, as I mentioned before, Eagle Scout candidates fundraise to supply materials. 
A little bit more about corporate days of service. They supply the manpower and the funding, and you supply the folks to supervise. Um, this particular team, MVP, uh, was located in Tarrytown along the Hudson River, sent a group over to a particular trail. Um, it happens their employee at that time was also associated with the trail conference, and the people absolutely loved being able to come here and work on the trail. I'd mentioned youth projects before. Um, I'm very familiar with uh, the Boy Scout Eagle um, candidates. I've had uh, something like 17 of them in uh, my town in the last um, eight years. Girl Scout Gold Awards are a little bit different. We've only had one of those, um, but I've had a number of civic internships. Um, the civic internship through our local high school is that they work, they have to put in 60 hours with a nonprofit or a civic organization um, to raise their own awareness of what either that type of entity does. In this case, Kim, um, five years ago, was my civic internship uh, person, and she had the job of developing a small map for each of the kiosks in our town parks that said what was nearby. Um, she was great. She did all the footwork. She located whether there were um, fast food places, sit down restaurants, um, uh, grocery stores. Uh, another item was a vet, uh, veterinary clinic because there's a dog park in our town. The um, having knowing where grocery stores were. And of course, you want to know where ice cream is. Um, youth projects require a little more attention than other episodic projects, but my husband and I have found that it's very rewarding to work with teenagers and to give them something that they can be proud of. And it takes um, jobs, volunteer jobs that we would need to do and gives them a sense of purpose. Now I want to talk about training. This is a question that was raised in a previous uh, workshop, the trail conference. Um, it happened to be an employee gave for, and it was funded by um, OPRHP for New York State. We train our volunteers. We hold training events. Um, we started 30 some years ago doing this. Um, we started out with sort of an all day event and have gradual and once a year, as we got need, had a greater need, it moved to twice a year. We started to make it regionalized, and now we have to hold them as a webinar. Um, in this instance, you can see people working. We trained them how to do side hilling so that the trail was easier to walk on. Um, and that's always a good opportunity. They can really see what's happened that they've done. And there's also through personal interaction. When I have a new maintainer, they have taken the webinar recently, and then I take them out and introduce them to the trail. Some cases they already know the trail and that's why they volunteered, they wanted to take care of it. In other instances, they've never been on it. Um, I review what they've learned uh, by showing them how to use the tools, point out problem areas that exist on that trail, and I hear back from them twice a year when they send in a report, or when there's a problem. Again, um, just like fundraising, you can have things about training, um, either how to do it or the actual content of training would take up many, many webinars. So here's some things for some online training classes. Okay, the trail conference has an online learning library, uh, which has a number of things, including stuff for invasives. They have trail maintenance, they have graffiti. I've used, I took, watched the graffiti workshop. I have had four different individuals watch it to take out, to remove some graffiti. And even when the trail conference volunteers couldn't go out, I gave it to, I pointed it out to the um, park superintendent. He had some of his um, people watch it and go out. It happened that the graffiti needed to be removed, had slurs on it, and we wanted to get that off as fast as possible. North Country Trail Association has a resource center, um, and it has a number of videos. In fact, the trail conference um, used one of their, portion of one of their videos in their training maintenance workshop. Um, so those are ones that 
um, are worth checking out um, to help improve your training of volunteers. People ask, have I ever had any failures? And the answer is yes. But I also like to look at it as a failure is a way um, to improve the next time. And it was a challenge. It didn't work. Let's see what we can do about it. The first one that you encounter often is a problem volunteer. Um, do you really want someone taking the blow, um, a leaf blower along the trail and removing all the leaves? And the answer is no. Um, the leaves fall in the, the, on the ground in the fall and they get ground in and they help the soil. Um, you don't want a, a maintainer out there using a chainsaw if they're not chainsaw certified. And that's not something you want them to use. You really don't. Motorized vehicle damage. Um, this cropped up in just in the last week. Uh, my husband's standing there in some damage that was done. Um, and in addition, um, the perpetrators also cross a trout stream. Um, and I'm working with the um, park uh, superintendent and the police to try to bring a stop to that destruction. We've had problems in the past. We've not been able to curb it but um, we know about when they go out and I'm hoping that they will be told they can't do it because those trails were not designed to, for motorized use. Is a rained out event a, pro a failure? Not necessarily. You just say, well, rain happens and uh, move on and reschedule. The pandemic was a failure in, um, for people in some respects, more so for some people than others. The trail conference went to doing uh, um, webinars to get people interested and as a result has picked up a fair number of people more interested in invasive species removal, uh, becoming volunteers, um, and so that I, none of us at the trail conference look at it as a total uh, imp the impact on our organization was not as great as we thought it would be. The lower left hand corner shows a photo with a trail relocation. We had we posted signs. We didn't people. We didn't want people on that, and so finally we had to put up uh, fencing with a wire running through it, and with steel posts and a sign that said that this was done with permission of the uh, Parks and Rec Department. So we now have another poll. Um, so um, Candace will put the next poll up. Okay. I'll keep it up more. for a few more seconds. Yeah, one of the answers is actually dominating <laughs> the others right now. So I'm yeah, just curious it, what you might think on that, Jane, but I'll just give it a, another few seconds. That sounds good. Okay. Hey, you did right on describing what everybody will be doing and assigning people. Um, Yes, that's good, but you've got the problem with the guy with the chainsaw, okay? So, order of priority, okay? Um, that safety talk has to come after what people will be doing. You can incorporate it. So those really, that was a trick question. So those really, I see that 75% of the people said that you should do one or the other. You can find the safety talk in with what people were doing. You should, as the person in charge, need to go and talk with that person who came came with a chainsaw off to one side and say, hey, hey, buddy, this is not an appropriate tool to bring to the workshop that we are having today. Um, berating him in any way or criticizing him in front of others will only make the problem worse, and he could storm off in uh, a huff at that point. So dealing with him tactfully. Um, Demonstrate what you're doing. That has to come after you have assigned uh, people to do it and have given the safety talk. All right. 
So I've built in here um, sharing ideas. Um, what have you learned from a failure or success working with volunteers? And we should answer in the question box in a few sentences. And Candace will pull out the question box so that we can share. This is one of the downsides of webinars. You don't have the opportunity to listen to somebody else, what they've had as a success or a failure, and learn from them. And I found when I've given workshops, I learn from the participants as much as I do um, drawing from my own knowledge. And I make sure that some of that um, knowledge is extended to other people. So Candace, as soon as something comes in, in the questions box, um, would you please, um, I'll read it. Sure thing. Yeah, we're getting a couple in so far. And um, we have Amy saying three hours is the maximum amount of time to hold volunteers' attention. Uh, Daniel says recognition is a critical element of a program. Barry and, I'm guessing, yeah, Barry. <laughs> volunteers, by and large, are a huge benefit. Uh, Troy says knowledgeable and adequately um, people-friendly crew leaders are key. Oh, we're getting so much more. Amy oh, says wow. also snacks are always a great thank you. <laughs> so we're getting quite a few coming in. I will um, be sharing these with Jane and also I, we will share these with the other attendees as well as takeaways um, in my follow-up email. So oh, that's, that's great. Um, and uh, when you see... I know when I ask people this question face to face, I'll get people saying, oh, you stole my idea. And the answer is <laughs> no. If you hear it from somebody else, you know and for two or three people, hey, this is something that works. And I'll assure you that the brownies and, and lemonade I brought on my work trip to build the boardwalk in the middle of the hot summer were a big hit. And one day I even sent someone over to the store to buy ice cream for everybody. Definitely appreciate it. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Recognitions. Um, I thank the person who said um, something about recognizing volunteers. That's great. So you will get um, this chart and the next one will be on one page for you. Uh, they don't fit in a PowerPoint at all. And I've uh, decided to cherry pick and just talk about some things um, that the rationale behind why these are good. Okay. Giving a volunteer a t-shirt, um, and we all know that you can get too many t-shirts <laughs> participating in events, does a couple of things. It's a thank you, yes, but it also tells the public um, about your organization. Okay, it legitimizes this uh, volunteer is doing work. And my two high school boys who were building the trail, I made sure that they had t-shirts because they've outgrown the ones from two years ago. And I told them they had to wear it whenever they worked on the trail if I wasn't there. Um, I didn't want them to be harassed by adults on what are you doing. Um, they notified uh, the park that they were going in that day. This was during the summer. Um, it's not so much of a problem now that school has started. They work on weekends. Um, the t-shirts the trail conference gives out are usually ones every year. They're different colors and it's kind of fun when volunteers show up as a rainbow of different colors of t-shirts because everybody has worked different years. Um, I have one from uh, over 10 years ago, which I wear upon occasion. Um, I'll go to the next one. All right, some more ideas for recognitions. Um, the trail conference um, always puts um, recognizes the volunteers who've worked on maps or brochures or books um, in those items as a way of, of recognizing that they have helped. When I start, first started volunteering, I would look in a, book, in a book or something and just see who I knew on that list. Turns out a very good friend of ours did the same thing. I don't do it so much anymore because I'm the one that's compiled the list. And I'm working on a book that will be out this fall called Walkable Westchester. And there are a fair number of people who are going to be recognized in that book as uh, providing at least 15 hours worth of work, whether it was checking trails, copy editing, um, taking pictures. Um, but it's always good to recognize people that um, they have helped. 
what I've done on this is I've talked about the easy, uh, how to implement things, um, their suitability and who gives it out. Um, I developed this chart um, when I was uh, on the, chairing the New York State Trails Council uh, board. And um, I got input from all kinds of groups as to ideas for recognitions, and then use this as a handout um, later. Because the one thing with unframed pit photos is that if you're taking photos of people, stop and think, how many times do you appreciate and you have received a photo from someone who's been on site and say, hey, I, saw, I did this while you were working. And um, uh, that's easy to do. Um, um, and then you have named awards um, that are often given by board of directors. Um, those are a really big, the biggest kind of award that you can hand out as recognizing volunteers. Uh, the trail conference recently received an award for what they do from the New York State Recreation and Park Society. Um, the trail conference works lots of places in New York State, not just necessarily in uh, Westchester where I live, but uh, it was a nice award to receive and to know that our work is valued. So a little bit more about thank yous and recognitions. Um, I thought I would give some examples. I bet all of you are wondering why this can opener is sitting there. Well, that was a thank you from when I took my Girl Scout troop on a canoe trip and the mothers that were along did not like the can opener that I had. It was very wimpy, they had told me later. So they presented me with a very good can opener, which I was much appreciated. Um, I felt it was necessary to celebrate the 500 plus foot boardwalk that we were building. Um, and telling people that we were now halfway. By the way, that boardwalk was eight feet wide. I've forgotten to mention that earlier. Another way I thank people is I'm a knitter and I like to knit and so I knit lots of hats. And I will give someone a hat um, as a thank you, which is very personalized. Um, on the flip side, if any of you happen to be here who are um, volunteers, okay, my similar position to what I hold. Um, the volunteer trail committee in Westchester gives a partner's breakfast every year. We didn't this past year because of COVID. Um, the volunteers produce a breakfast like you wouldn't believe. There's usually bacon, um, some scrambled eggs, a quiche. Um, I'm making you hungry right now, I'm sure. Um, some homemade baked goods, uh, yogurt, fruit, coffee, hot chocolate, you name it, it's on the table. And um, it's a way that we can thank our partners for helping us and giving us the opportunity to work in the parks. It gives them an opportunity to interact with people who hold similar positions, but they might not necessarily have an opportunity to interact with. We also put a program on at that point to um, uh, give them some additional information. We've done something on invasives. Um, I was going to do one on Walkable Westchester, my book, but that got, because this was canceled, that was not one that was held. Okay, celebrate the completion of projects. The photo on the left was when we opened the boardwalk officially. Um, people were already using it. As you can tell, it was a rainy day. This particular project was near and dear to uh, Linda Cooper, who is head, the regional director for OPRHP here in the Hudson Valley. She had been supervisor in our town and this was a project that she wanted to see completed and she was delighted to see that that had been done. The other project there on the right was opening a section of the Appalachian Trail in New Jersey. This was in 2002. Um, this section um, made it possible that you did not have to have a long road walk um, around an area that uh, flooded a lot. Okay, so let's have another poll and um, give you a chance to read this and then uh, Candace will put up um, the results.
Okay. So it's interesting how many people picked Alex. There's really no wrong answer, okay? Because you need to think of what your project is gonna be. Um, Chris is actually real. real. Um, she is someone here in my town um, and has helped and wants to step up to more responsibilities. Um, Alex is a conglomeration of a number of people and Leslie is also a conglomeration of several people. Um, it depends, a lot depends upon your project on who you will choose. So there's no one answer. And Candace, if you put down um, some of the answers that people put in the chat box, that would be great. Um, so far, we don't have anyone oh, okay. answer anything in the chat box right now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, all right, I'm going to move on. So it's time for some questions and answers. And you can see two of our volunteers from the trail conference sporting their uh, trail conference t-shirt. Um, they've been busy working on a project and both of them are retirees. Uh, that particular trail crew is all retirees and we have a young un who is 62. So hopefully people will start to put in some questions. Yeah, we definitely have some questions right now. Um, we do have that sharing ideas. Did you want to do that one last after we do some Q&A? It's the next yes, slide the, before I get to let's my do the, Right, let's do the Q&A first. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so the first, um, quite a few people actually were asking this as they were registering in regards to um, insurance and liability questions. Okay, thank you for um, any of you who had uh, brought the, that question up. I am not qualified to answer insurance questions. That's not an area. But if you have them, I know someone who is specializes in outdoor activities insurance. And if you send uh, Candace your name, she'll forward it to me and I will get hold, I will let him know that you're interested. Um, I do know for the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, they have ways of covering their um, volunteers. Through New York State Parks, uh, we have insurance. Um, National Park Service has it for those who are in national parks. And the trail conference covers, um, has insurance that covers all the others um, that are not covered by those uh, other two entities. So Candace, the next question. Okay, we're getting some COVID questions in, and this is a good one um, from Angela, just how to celebrate your volunteers during COVID. They have had an amazing volunteer year, which has been up 150% over most other years. So what advice do you have for recognition um, during COVID? Okay, that's a tough question to answer because you can't have celebrations. You can't really have any food, okay? Depending upon what your budget is, um, I know some groups have what they call a punch card and you've come out on so many work trips that gains you some swag of some sort. Um, uh, if you have the, the ability to give them um, say a t-shirt or um, this year the trail conference used, um, their, the generic name is not Buffs, but that was the one who originally did it and it has a uh, trail conference on it. Um, and that's really nice, especially in colder weather or for people who want to protect their neck from sun. Um, having something that says that you've helped this year, something physical is really good. I hope that answers your question. What's the next Thank one? you so much. All right, uh, a couple people are asking um, when you first started the presentation in regards to going rogue, um, someone, uh, Charles had mentioned that the word is associated with violence desertion, et cetera, not a calm state of mind. So how are you describing um, going rogue in your presentation? Okay. Oh, sorry if I used it in the wrong connotation, everybody. Um, going rogue, is, rogue would be doing something they're not supposed to, okay? Going out and chainsawing, taking a, a leaf blower onto the trail, using something that's not allowed on the trail, um, a horse, a mountain bike, 
a motorized vehicle on a foot only trail. So that's, that's an example. Um, cutting back too much vegetation um, is another example um, of going rogue. So I hope that answers it and thank you for pointing that out. All right, Ashley has a great question. Um, she mentioned that she noticed that many trail volunteers are part of the demographic or who are part of the demographic of retired and white. How do you approach recruiting and recognizing volunteers through the lens of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion? Oh, that's a super good question. That has come to the forefront. I was involved with the American Hiking Society and was on their board. They are really working to get uh, people who are minorities feeling comfortable on trails, okay? Um, one of the things with getting a better age demographic is that when you have a family that has two bred people who are trying to put the, the food on the table, they both work full-time, they've got kids, it's very hard to get them involved, okay? Um, you notice that I, I, I reach down to teens. I figure if I can get them involved now, they might continue to volunteer, whether it's on trails or somebody else. The other thing I've noticed, and other people have verified this, when I've worked on um, looking at uh, trails near areas that have uh, minorities, we see people out on the trails who look like their community. I'm the oddball out um, in those instances, and they have been also. Volunteers have more time and we're aware, everyone is aware of that and it's how to recruit on an age difference to get people involved. And this is where episodic uh, events come in to play because you can get people there on a one-time basis. They can set time aside, they can come out and they can meet other people. When uh, my husband and I were working on the uh, very big boardwalk, we had retirees and we had youth. We had only one person who showed up, I'm sorry, two people who showed up who were in the uh, 40 year age, age range. But that's a good question. It, it's something that the trail community, at least the hiking trail community is very aware of and is working to try to, um, to, to fix that. Okay, what's the next? Great. Um, <clears throat> Rob asks, how often should we meet for general maintenance so as not to burn people out? Oh, okay. Let me tell you what the trail conference does, because uh, that's where my experience lies. Trail maintenance, um, they ask that their uh, volunteers go and they're assigned trails to go out at least twice a year, once in what they call our spring and once in the fall. There are people who go out more often because they have trails that require that. And you have people who like to garden and this is basically trail maintenance is the same. Um, you want them to be able to see what they've done, but not have so much that they feel overwhelmed. So a lot depends upon the trail you're having them do it and getting a feel of what your volunteer base is. Um, when I was doing the 500 foot boardwalk, we met twice a week. I did not burn people out um, because my base of people coming was about 35 and I'd end up most times with um, 10 each time. So um, it is something that you have to pay attention to. Thank you for asking that question. Um, a follow up on the rogue um, question from Patrice. How do you handle a rogue volunteer without antagonizing them? Okay, and we're using the rogue as I, um, I had to find it, okay. Um, if they've gone rogue, you do need to explain to them what the rules are. I'm fortunate that um, we the trail conference volunteers have staff that they can pull into if they have that kind of situation. Um, the trail conference had a situation where someone was harassing um, and they had to have him stop. They couldn't have him out on the trips. And unfortunately, he was a good volunteer. He was very skilled. And some of the people didn't see that his behavior was a problem but it was a problem and so eventually no you cannot come you cannot be there and we will um i don't know how they finally got him off of helping on a crew but that was indeed a problem um some people who go rogue um 
I know of an instance where they had, you had to say, no, you're cutting it back too much. There's some plants here that um, you just can't do that to. And I'm going to have to let you go. You can't maintain. So you do have to, have, sometimes it's not nice. I've had to do it. It's not pretty. Um, just like within uh, any kind of personnel or HR work, have another person along to back you up. Great. All right. Ernest asks the question, how do you deal with the gung-ho volunteer who is going to hurt themselves, such as a guy or person who is picking up big rocks or other things that will probably not end well? Oh, what a lovely one. Okay. This is where your safety talk comes in. I know from having a safety, uh, someone talk about doing safety, and I have had this instance with an, a volunteer, is if you have someone like that who's going to hurt themselves, you assign another volunteer to work with them and make sure that they don't do that. Um, uh, demonstrating how you pick up rocks, okay. Um, we use what's called a rock carrier and have several people uh, carrying it. Uh, another name is a rock basket. Um, it's great for carrying uh, rocks a short distance that one would not want to lift alone. Um, and you always make sure that people are kneeling, um, I'm sorry, squatting and lift and don't bend over. Um, uh, I would definitely, you, and if you catch them a second, you give them a warning and if you catch them the second time, they say, no, you can't do that. Um, it's, there's too many safe, there's safety uh, things with it. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay. All right, Lydia, um, and a, a few people are asking about remote areas. Um, Lydia asks, do you have any advice for getting volunteer tra trail maintainers in the remote back country for sections that might require overnight stays due to the remote access? Okay, um, I believe um, West, um, Washington Trails Association runs that kind of trip. So I can't answer that because I live in suburban New York City and there's no remote here. Um, I have had a, some work trips where the state park gave permission for the crew to camp because they had the amount of equipment they had to handle, hang, you know, haul in. Um, I would suggest that they uh, go on to West um, Washington Trails Association's website and find out how to ask that question to someone there. I don't have the expertise to be able to answer it other than to refer you to some more information. These have all been great, great. questions. <laughs> they are really great questions. Um, a couple questions in regards to using conservation cores. Um, I had a comment I wanted to give you first. I'm trying to find, oh, here we go. Yes, Chris. Chris had a comment before I asked someone else's question. Um, let's see, bringing in people who aren't retired. Um, AmeriCorps is a great resource or is a great source of volunteerism, especially through partnership, because they could reach out to other people to volunteer too. And so in regards to her comment, a question that came in from Amanda is, where do conservation corps fit in with volunteers? What advice do you have to give? Okay. Uh, the Trail Conference has had a lot of experience with Conservation Corps, um, funded by OPRHP. They they do um, some really heavy rock work, um, some heavy building. Um, they haven't done anything with bridges, I know that, because they've asked uh, my husband and I, can you give us some uh, guidance there? Um, the OPRHP apply, uh, gave a grant to the Trail Conference, and they have pulled in um the conservation corps members um i i recommend them um they those conservation corps members ended up a number of them have been hired by the trail conferences entry level positions and they are now i know um at least one of them had signed up for the webinar i don't know if she's on okay because she had been involved with them she got a position here at the trail conference so I don't know if that completely answers your question. I would go to the uh, Conservation Corps website and find out um, how you get hold of um, them to be able to sponsor something, okay? But I know that they're very All right, good. This, 
This question came in earlier from Mark, and I just want to make sure that it was explained, but he just asked if you could explain how volunteers are not free in your disadvantages slide. Sure. Okay. Um, remember we were talking about recognizing them and supervising them? Those are the non-free things with them, okay? They are an incredible resource, okay? And can do things and can expand your budget. But you do have to realize that managing Westchester Parks Foundation, they have two people that manage their program. So those volunteers are not free in the sense that they've had to hire two people. But I can assure you the two people could not do what, what those work trips are can do. Okay, I hope that answered his question. Uh, Tracy asks, what about taking the work away from paid employees? That is sometimes an issue with federal projects. Yep, that's the same thing as the union <laughs> question <laughs> that I, I partially answered. Um, that has to be worked out on an individual basis on and i know in the cat skills there was a couple of rangers there that resented the volunteers because they felt that it was taking um things away but if you if you look at the volunteer jobs as something that someone paid would not do you can probably get around that i'm not completely qualified to answer that I might have a conversation with you later, the person who asked the question, and maybe can direct you to some other sources that might be able to answer it a bit better. All right. I'm not sure if it's Tamara or Tamara, but she asks, are there any suggestions for helping different volunteers from different user groups work positively together, especially ones who may have butted heads prior? Oh, lovely. Um, let's see. Um, when I did the 500 foot board walk, the, some of the adults worked better with the youth than others, okay? And, um, but there, I would say the vast majority for that age difference worked, worked better than I had initially expected, okay? Um, where I live, the uh, mountain bikers and the uh, hikers get along fine, okay? Um, that's because when we were working to establish trails in parks, they were um, initially, let's put it this way, I was a little taken back when they offered to help at first and thinking, this is my project. And I realized later that was really being dumb. And I have embraced them totally um, on helping with trails um, in a variety of ways. Um, Motorized users are a different one, and I'd rather not go down that rabbit hole um, for personal reasons. And um, equestrians are a little harder. Um, I know some areas, for instance, on the Appalachian Trail in the Smokies, they're allowed there, but other places, the rest of the trail, aside from one place in New York, they are not. But they, that, those user groups have helped each other tremendously because the horses can carry equipment in to the back country. So it's a lot of it's a personal thing on establishing rapport one on one and then moving out from there. I hope that answers the question. All right, Timothy, um, and I'm not sure if maybe the Washington Trails Association may be a good um, resource for this, but what do you feel is the best method to recruit volunteers in rural areas? That's a sticky question. Um, I know that the Catskills for maintainers there, it's been a problem because of the weekenders. Newspaper articles are probably the best way to recruit. Um, getting a reporter out um, to um, uh, photograph and report on the, the event is another. Uh, the trail conference has a database of members that's also very useful that we're used to say for someone to uh, maintain here. I know when the Shangam Ridge Trail was being built, they were able to get volunteers out in the western part of New Jersey um, up to the Catskills by doing uh, newspaper outreach. 
But that, that's a tough. Right. That is a tough mm -hmm. one. That's a very tough, tough <laughs> way of recruiting. <laughs> Um, Lee is asking, um, what about entering into memorandums of agreement? Do you deal Excellent. with that? Oh, yes. I'm glad you brought that up. When um, my husband and I first approached the town on maintaining trails in the town parks, especially since there was a new piece of property being acquired, we asked wanted a mem an MOU, which is a memorandum of understanding between the town and um, the trail conference. It spells out what we do as volunteers, what the park does, and what both of us can do or, or talk back and forth who does. Example is funding. Um, I recommend them. Sometimes they can be really sticky and sometimes they are, um, let's put it this way. We'd like uh, the trail conference is not a friend of the a friends group for new OPRHP. Um, we have a hundred year track record with them. And I've been involved with the friends group twice with OPRHP and they have an equivalent MOU with the friends group. It spells out what you can do. Um, they are legally binding. Okay. On the other hand, the, uh, here in Westchester, where we work in county parks, we have a handshake. And um, we weren't looking to expand to an MOU. Um, a lot of it is whether the partner demands it. And I know in New Jersey, there have been problems with um, trying to renew every five years. And the one that I have here in Yorktown is set up that new parks can be added to the list of where we maintain. It doesn't have to have the MOU renegotiated. And we've had our third. MOU when we've seen and either party has seen a need for it. So um, I like it that I have things spelled out. All right, we'll do one more question before we get into the last few slides because I know you want to share some more ideas. Um, this last one comes from Drew from Australia. Welcome, Drew. Um, he has mentioned that they've seen a huge shift in demographics age-wise volunteering there, especially with more younger people wanting to volunteer. Uh, are you seeing um, or experiencing the same in young people coming forward to volunteer um, on your end? I think there's a big interest in it, uh, especially since they um, uh, can see some direct results of their volunteering. And I'd like to point out to Drew, who is in Australia, when my family was there, not me, but my daughter and her family were there um, three years ago, they had a project for volunteering that they loved. It was tracking koalas. So these are, these are preteen kids that were, did that and it made a big hit with them. I think they're never gonna find a, a more unique volunteer situation. And I think when you have opportunities for young people and that you can draw them in like the two boys that I have, you're setting a stage for later in life uh, for them and to you know keep, keep trying to draw those younger people in. They're a lot of fun to work with. So thank you, Drew. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we have a couple more slides um, from from Jane. Whoops, sorry. A couple more slides from Jane, and I'll have you take over before we end the webinar. Okay. Um, this is a, I had some for sharing ideas. What are your next steps? Um, we are almost at the end of the webinar. Okay. So I like to ask when I do an in-person workshop, what is your next step? What are you going to do? What you've learned here, and what is your another term is what is your takeaway so again if it can go into the chat box um or the question box that would help and i think uh given the time constraints uh candace is going to have to pick and choose what she's going to share and don't worry if you have an idea that is that someone else has had as well because it just shows that it's a good idea okay anything come in yet uh, Candace? OK. 
Okay. Okay, are there any questions? Any come, come in, Candace? What I am so sorry. I was on mute. I was I was saying a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. All right, we have quite a few coming in. And of course, if I don't get to all of them, I will share these with Jane as well as um, share them uh, with everyone. Um, because I'm sure that everyone's interested in hearing. So we have uh, Tracy, advertise more locations, have a project very defined. Um, Angela, refine and improve what they've been doing with some great suggestions uh, that you've provided here, Jane. Um, Ernest added what he is learning to his toolbox of volunteer work. Uh, Kelly is creating a new trail in their community, and the first step will be recruiting volunteers according to your steps. Uh, we'll just give a couple more here. Uh, Rob also agrees with advertising and organizing dates for future planning. And Charles, their next project is getting a group together to pick up all the litter along 30 miles of bike routes um, that they want to connect. So there are a bunch more that I will share with everyone in my follow-up email. Well, that, sound, that sounds great. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide. Okay. So as I'm going in closing, I'm going to say, make an effort to know your volunteer leaders. Okay. I know some of the volunteers uh, that I know from the trail conference, they were even invited to um, their park partner's wedding. Okay. Which just shows the kind of relationship that they have with their park partner. Talk with your volunteers, find out what they're good, good at um, and use them in that capacity. Sometimes, your uh, volunteer is pushed into an area that they're not as comfortable with, and you're there to help help them get over that hump or not even uh, go in that direction. The trail, the Appalachian Trail um, Conservancy has that you uh, establish trust and delegation with their volunteers. That makes a huge difference. Um, it's a tough pill to swallow when you first start to swallow it, but then you realize how much it benefits you in the, uh, the long term. And remember to thank them. And volunteers, for any of you who are in the volunteer segment that are uh, interacting with uh, your park partner, make sure you thank them because they provide stuff that you can't do. And I can tell you the relationship I have with the park superintendent here in Yorktown is terrific. Um, he's the fourth one I've had in 10 years. He was on the rec commission when I, when Walt and I started. And um, he knows when he can ask me things that he doesn't quite understand because he's not a hiker. Um, and I in turn can turn to him when there's, there's problems that I'm not I'm not supposed to do. So I know when to contact him. So it's a two way street. I view this from the volunteer side, um, but I know that the relationships I have with the um, partners that I deal with is just invaluable. And I really tr I treasure them to say the least. So I want to um, close by thanking all of you for coming. Um, I can see that people had um, left early, which is understandable. And I want to particularly thank Candace for all the support that she has given me for doing this webinar. So um, hope you enjoy your day. And for those who are many time frames uh, uh, zones away from me, I hope you didn't have to get up too early or stay up too late to be listen to this. <laughs> Well, okay. thank you so much, Jane. Really appreciate your time. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we did have a lot more questions and we also have those comments from the from the share your ideas. Um, I will be working with Jane to answer some of the questions that we missed. Um, and then as soon as we get those questions answered, you know, if she has the time, um, I will email you all as well as uh, add it to the web page. But you are also welcome to email Jane. Um, I will send you this slide that you see here. And it has um, Jane's email address in my follow-up email. And uh, the very first link that you see here is a link to the web page that we created for the webinar. All of these links are on there, including the handouts um, that you uh, see here. So um, yeah, thank you. 
And uh, thank you again to everyone for your interest in this installment of the New York uh, State Webinar Series brought to you by content from the New York State Recreation and Park Society Conference, which is free thanks to a generous sponsorship again from the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, the Recreational Trails Program, and the Federal Highway Administration. And we hope you'll be able to join us for future webinars offered in our Advancing Trails webinar series. I noted immediate upcoming webinars on this slide that you can register for right now, and both of these are free. And of course, if you miss any of our live webinars, they are available as recordings to download at any time in our online store. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and happy trails.